The general topic of this module is about implementation of a file system. We will see several concepts related to how file or directory operations perceived by users are implemented into relevant operations to the secondary storage. Let's look first at historical background to remind ourselves how we get to where we are today. In the 30s, mainframe computers were connected to punch card readers to read input data from punch cards. But punch cards were also used for output. In the 50s, not shown in this picture, magnetic tapes were widely used for both input and output. Magnetic storage medium continued to be used into the 60s, again not shown in this picture, but in a different format. Hard disk drives, which is so much faster than tape drives because a hard drive continues to spin at higher speed. Then in the 70s and 80s, floppy drives of various size were used, starting with 8 inch drive and then 5 and a quarter inch drive and then later to a 3.5 inch drive. And in the 90s, non-magnetic storage mediums were becoming popular during the time like CD-ROMs, writable CDs, and DVDs were widely used for distributing software and also for backups. And in the 2000s, the trend was to use non-mechanical storage devices because they are more reliable and also faster. And finally, we see how cloud storage is the norm today. In the previous module, when we talk about file system interface, we don't really care whether the data is from a floppy drive, a CD-ROM, DVD, or a remote storage. In this module, when we talk about file system implementation, we will see the chain of operations when a program attempts to access a file. There are five major topics related to file system implementation. First, we're going to look at the internal structure of files and directories. And then next, we're going to look at different technique to allocate or deallocate space needed for files on physical disk or storage. And also, we will see how the file system will perform mapping from logical file structures to physical blocks of bytes on the secondary storage. And then we also look at what is the meaning of file system format. So let's say we're going to see how uh, VFAT is different from ex 2 or from NTFS. And then the last topic, important topic, is how we recover corrupted data because at times operations to your storage device may not be able to complete and that will create an inconsistent state of your data. And just to remind you, when we talk about a storage device, uh, we can either refer to a solid state drive or a hard disk drive. From our discussion about processor management and memory management, we see a few examples how our operating system creates many different illusions. And then the goal is to present a programming model that is easy for the user to use. We'll continue to see more illusions when the operating system handles file operations. For instance, the first illusion, the user will think that their data are always contiguous. And then the second, their data may be stored into a single physical device. And then third illusion is that they will think that their data are always saved to a non-volatile storage. But in fact, this is not true. Because for instance, when you try to install a new operating system to your computer, you may boot the operating system from a CD. And at that point, the operating system will not alter the current operating system on your hard drive. And in order for that installation process to work, the operating system may create a temporary file system on memory. So in Linux, for instance, there is a type of file system known as RAM FS because that file system is not persisted into 
your hard drive, but the file system exists only on your physical memory. Among the main jobs of a file system is to translate system calls issued by your process to operate on a file or directory to lower level disk block operations. And again, we're going to use the word disk when the underlying storage can be either a hard drive or a solid state drive. The programming model presented to the user allows the user to think that their files are documents organized nicely into different shelves. Each document is carefully labeled with the date when it is created, with the document name and the owner, and so on. This programming model should work the same regardless of the implementation details of the file system. For instance, the actual file system may be either a VFAT running on Windows or an XX2 running on Linux. And maybe the actual destination of the file is either a DVD drive or a USB drive or a hard drive, and many other details which are hidden from the user. When mainframe computers were widely used in the 60s, the most common storage devices were probably magnetic tapes and hard drives, and they were most likely manufactured by the same company. Today, the design landscape is more complex, and operating systems must be designed to handle a larger variety of storage devices like CD drives, DVD drives, flash drive, SSD, hard drives, and also a variety of input-output protocols to connect to these devices. Like now you see USB version 1, version 2, version 3. So this is why a layered design is preferred. Let's use an example of handling the fopen system call from a C program. The syntax of fopen should be the same regardless of the target operating system where the C program will run. So the first module in the layer design is the file system APIs that present the same interface regardless of the underlying operating system that implements the actual system call. The subsequent modules in the chain would be specific to each operating system variant. So for instance, the first module inside the operating system file system deals with file metadata. For instance, at this level, the OS would verify if the requesting process is permitted to open the file or the OS will verify that the file can be opened in a particular mode because you can request a file to be opened in binary mode, but the file is actually an ASCII file or maybe the file is write protected and you try to open the file for writing. The next module deals with converting logical file pointer position to physical block numbers. From the point of view, from the logical point of view of the user, a file is associated with a file pointer that can move forward and backward. But the physical implementation of moving the file pointer backward or forward will translate to which block will be read from your storage device. The next module, Basic File System, is responsible for managing the block read-write operations and direct these operations to the right destination because perhaps the file that you try to open is actually on a CD or maybe on a hard drive. That's why the Basic File System is responsible for directing the basic block operations to the proper device. The last module, which is called the IO controller, or sometimes we call it device driver, is specific to each device. Because for instance, IO commands for transferring data from a USB drive, flash drive, 
is maybe different from IO commands from transferring data from a DVD drive. In order to support all its internal operations within each module in the layer design earlier, the operating system works with a number of data structures. Some of these data structures are to be persisted on the storage device, like the file metadata, the multi-level tree structure of the user directory. In addition, the operating system also maintains a few in-memory data structure that are not persisted to the storage device. For instance, there will be tables to keep track which files are currently open by user programs or which user volumes are currently mounted when let's say you inserted your USB drive to your computer. These tables in the operating system are also known as control blocks. So for instance, for managing processes in your system, the operating system uses a table called process control block, which hold important information like process ID, memory use, the amount of CPU time, process priority, and so on. Same thing for managing files. The operating system will keep a table known as file control block, this table will hold important information such as the file owner, file size, the buffer location, the current file pointer position, and so on. Just to emphasize the two types of table that may be maintained by the operating system, this page shows you two programs, process 1 and process 2, in green and in yellow, and let's say process one uses the open system call to open a file. And if you remember, open is a function that return a file descriptor. And for the green process, the system will create a table. This is what we call per process open file table. Same thing for the yellow process. When the yellow process uses open to open a file, the system will create another table specific to that process. So for this example, you will see two tables, one per process, but in addition to per process open table, the operating system will also maintain a global table or a system-wide table to keep track of all open files in the system. In the previous module, we talked about disk partitions, but let's look at the details of different terms used in a hard drive. So in a hard drive, data are recorded into concentric tracks. So the red circle here is a track. So usually track zero begins at the outer circle of your disk and track one is the next one and so on. A track is usually divided into several sectors. So in our example, we see 12 sectors per track. In a typical hard drive, you will see several disks stacked into one main spindle. So if you take one track from the first plate and the same track number from the second plate and so on and so forth, you will get a cylinder. So a cylinder is practically a collection of track from different plates. Now it's also common to see several adjacent sectors are combined into one cluster. So why do we create multiple partitions in a single hard drive? Well, the most common reason is for us to install multiple operating systems on the same hard drive. So probably you want to install both Windows and Linux at the same time. And also by dividing your hard drive into partitions, you can create backup of different partitions at different time. So instead of making backup of the entire disk, you can just create a backup of a particular partition. So the two types of partitions commonly used today are MBR, Master Boot Record, 
and GPT, GUID partition table. MBR is the older spec that allows only up to four partitions and it uses 32-bit address. The newer spec, GPT, allows you to create as many as 128 partitions and it uses 64-bit address. So using this number, you can estimate the total capacity of your hard disk. So let's assume that your hard drive is formatted so then each block, each sector in your hard drive is formatted to 512 byte of data. If you do the math with 32-bit address, that means we can have up to 2 to the power of 32 blocks. And each block is 512 bytes or 2 to the power of 9. If you multiply the two numbers together, you will get 2 to the power of 41, which is equal to 2 terabyte. Now, with the GPT, because it gives you 64-bit address, that means the hard drive can have as many as 2 to the power of 64 blocks. And again, if we are using 512-byte blocks, then the total size would be 2 to the power of 64 times 2 to the power of 9. That will give you 2 to the power of 73. And that number is equal to 8 zeta bytes, which is a lot. What if the hard drive combines adjacent blocks into a bigger cluster? So instead of having individual blocks of 512 bytes, what if the hard drive combines several blocks into a bigger size cluster of 4K bytes? And again, using these numbers, then you can see the capacity would be 2 to the power of 32, how do we get this number? Because we are using 32-bit address. So that means the disk can have as many as 2 to the power of 32 blocks. But now the size of each block, or in this case, each cluster, is 4K, and 4K is equal to 2 to the power of 12. If you multiply the two numbers together, you'll get 2 to the power of 44, which is equal to 16 terabytes. And again, for the GPT drive, you can do the math and it will give you 64 zeta bytes. So why do we see so many different file systems like NTFS, EXT2, EXT3, VFAT, and so on and so forth? To understand this concept, let's first look at image formats. So we know different image formats like JPEG, PNG, BMP, and so on. So in general, when you look at an image file, the important metadata in that file would be the image size, like how many columns, how many rows in the image, how many bits assigned per pixel, what is the color map, what is the compression table, and of course, the binary data of the image itself. If you read the spec of these image format, you will see the spec will tell you how these data are laid out inside an image file. So for instance, for a JPEG, maybe the height of the image is found in offset 10, maybe the width is offset 12. But for a PNG, maybe the width of the image is in offset 4, maybe the height is in offset 6. So a file format basically specifies the layout of an image file, how different data is stored inside the file. So using this analogy, a file system format is basically the same. So if you look at a file system, the important metadata for a file system is like the size, the total size of the file system how many blocks allocated to the file system, how many free blocks, how many index blocks, how many files are there, what is the structure of the directory, and so on and so forth. So then when you create a file system, basically you design the layout how a disk will be organized into different parts. 
So if you compare the two again, the image format is like how to lay out different items of an image into a file. And a file system format is basically how to lay out different important information into your disk.